Um, when I stood here this time last year, I recounted how I had asked my young daughter what International Women's Day meant to her. And this year I did the same thing. And now that she's seven, she said to me, Mummy, are you trying to get information for your speech again? <laughs> so it rumbled. Um, <laughs> but then she said to me, seriously, Mummy, why isn't it International Women's Day every day? And I did think that's quite amazing that that generation is growing up questioning that and questioning why we're actually doing, sorry, doing something like this. So it just made me reflect in the last year, I think we have just come so far. And the theme for International Women's Day this year is Each for Equal, which is based on the notion of collective individualism and how our individual thoughts and actions and mindsets can actually have an impact on things globally. And reflecting on the last year, the Me Too movement has been an incredible example of collective individualism and how a couple of lone voices, powerful voices, but, but still lone frightened voices in predominantly a, a male industry stood up and toppled a Hollywood giant. And I think that has sent ripples of support to women globally everywhere to encourage us to, to keep fighting the good fight. So bringing this closer to home, we're really privileged to have Julie Noon here today as our guest speaker. Julie is someone who has witnessed firsthand the impact of collective individualism um, in her line of work. She's an investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker, and she's lived, worked and played in over 60 countries, including South Sudan, Central African Republic and Afghanistan, where she spent months embedded with the British forces. Uh, Specialising in foreign affairs for award-winning series and critically acclaimed strands, Julie has produced, directed and series produced for the likes of Channel 4 Dispatches, Unreported World and the BBC's This, this World. Julie's work has been shortlisted for numerous awards and several of her films have been shown in Parliament with some prom promoting, prompting sorry, policy and legal change. Please give Julie a very warm welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop it over. So today's session is going to be a question and answer with Julie. So I'm going to ask some questions. But if any of you want to ask questions, feel free. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. It's a great privilege to see you all. I am... Um, very excited to be in London. I've had a night's <laughs> sleep without a three-year-old climbing in my bed. <laughs> so I'm more tired than normal because I spent all night waking for, waiting for him to arrive and he didn't. So that, <laughs> so if anyone relates to that. I have a three and a six-year-old who uh, six years on with sleep deprivation means I have to bring in a couple of notes these days to keep me on track. So uh, <laughs> forgive me if I wonder or forget an odd figure or something. Um, it's really nice to be here with you. I will sit down and set when I sort of myself out. Always put a mic on your back is the lessons I've learned. Uh, because otherwise when you stand up, you, when you sit down, your legs fold and you pop them off in investigative journalism. Um, I started my career in uh, politics, actually. Um, I did consumer stuff at, anyone remember London Weekend Television? I'm, I'm a bit older than I look, <laughs> I'm giving it away. <laughs> but I actually started working in um, PR and communications. I lived in Hong Kong for a couple of years, heading up comms for an international property consultancy. And I looked after Southeast Asia, which was great fun. Um, um, I got to travel all over uh, Southeast Asia with work, which is always a good thing to do. Um, and then I, I came back to the UK and moved into journalism from there. But my heart has always been foreign affairs. I was born in Kenya. I'm third generation. Africa is my real kind of heart home, if you like. Um, and over the years of, of traveling and working, as Sarah said, I've, I've been to many different places. And through that time, my real passion has become I've covered all sorts of stuff and done lots of domestic stuff through working on dispatches and panorama, etc. But, and as I said, lots of British politics. Um, I used to, in fact, do, uh, I literally was calculating swing for the swingometer in the 2005 <laughs> election um, for Peter Snow, if anyone remembers that as well. Yeah. yeah. Slightly concerning. My husband thinks that's hilarious because maths is absolutely not my strong point. <laughs> and that would come these figures on, you know, national television for calculated swing. And Andy would go, were they right? <laughs> I've no idea, but they were on TV, it's fine. So never trust what you see is the moral of that. <laughs> um, but over the years, my passion has really grown and grown. I've always been for foreign affairs, but really for women and um, children, which is why the theme of International Women's Day today is so relevant to, um, to storytelling um, and, and what we do. Because... Uh, Without women achieving equality globally, and equally I'd like to say right at the top, we need to achieve equality for a whole bunch of men as well. It's got to be hand in hand. We're never going to manage it globally and entirely, um, which will impact each and every one of us in this room without sort of all coming together. 
So I think we need to sort of start with um, what collective individualism actually is. Mm. <laughs> and how do you view collective individualism in respect of achieving equality? So the idea, if you break it down, there are two words that sound like you must, of course, we know what that means. But actually, if you break it down, the whole idea, I think, is that each of us is absolutely unique. We know this, but we never really stop to consider it properly. And particularly if you work in high-achieving teams, which many of you, you know, do in this room, but also in your family and globally, we need to really understand what our uniqueness is and individually what we can do. We are all designed to be different. We're a bit like, there's a, there's a few analogies. It's like the sea. Everybody's like a, um, a very small drop of water, absolutely unique, but put it together and you create an ocean which works in unison. Um, or snowflakes, I like the snowflake one. Every, did you know every single snowflake is designed differently? Everyone's seen the photos, the up close photos of snowflakes. They're extraordinary, they're exquisite. They're really exquisite, but they're absolutely unique. And every single person is a bit like that. We're all designed unique, but put it together, we make a mass of snow and boy, can avalanches do some damage. I like to see women like avalanches coming together and, you know, doing some damage and in a positive way, clearly, not a, a negative way. But I think the idea of, um, of making it collective is, comes from a starting point of we all need to feel like we belong. I think the theme of belonging is the essential part, and I've seen it over and over and over in all of um, the stories or the places that I've been to, the people I've spoken to, both women and men, children. A sen an inner sense of belonging, and we all experience it as individuals. We, when we feel like we belong, we're empowered to kind of step up and realise our potential individually and our skill sets, our knowledge, our confidence. We need each other to help us do that, but a sense of belonging, I think, is a real theme that I'm going to kind of we'll carry through the whole of today. I think it's really important, if this sense together. I wanted to read you, um, um, oh, actually, the, um, I was going to say Maslow's hierarchy, if I'm familiar with Maslow, he actually puts love and belonging right in the foundation of the pyramid. You can't go on and excel and exceed in your potential in any way unless you have a sense of love or belonging. And I think that that is really core cool to this sense of collective individualism and promoting a equality in, in every area. I want to read you something because um, it's far more eloquent than I can actually put it, but it really encapsulates, I think, the real core of it. Um, Desmond Tutu, um, much more eloquent than I, clearly. <laughs> He writes about a concept of Ubuntu. Has any, does anybody know, heard of this in the room? Yeah, okay. So uh, Ubuntu is um, it's a quality that effectively encapsulates kind of human virtues, and it talks about compassion and love. In Africa, when we say to somebody, oh, hi, how are you? Um, somebody will say back to you, um, we're fine, thanks, or actually, we're not so good today. The idea being that as an individual, that person might be absolutely fine, but if granny isn't well, then actually together, we're not well as a family unit. Um, and I think that that is a really strong kind of metaphor of what we're trying to achieve in terms of uh, collectively, we've all got to be well to create equality. I'll just read you very quickly what Desmond Tutu says, because he's um, brilliant um, on this. <laughs> The first law of our being is that we are set in a delicate network of interdependence with our fellow human beings and with the rest of God's creation. In Africa, recognition of our interdependence is called Ubuntu. Those are the languages, as some of the languages of Southern Africa, Zosho, Zulu, there's, uh, it's got other names in other languages. It is the essence of being human. It speaks of the fact that my humanity is caught up and inextricably bound with your humanity. I am human because I belong. It speaks about wholeness. It speaks about compassion. A person with Ubuntu is welcoming, hospitable, warm, and generous, willing to share. Such people are open and available to others, willing to be vulnerable, affirming of others, do not feel threatened when others are able and good, for they have a proper self-assurance that comes from knowing that they belong in a greater whole. They know that they are diminished when others are humiliated, diminished when others are oppressed, diminished when others are treated as if they were less than who they are meant to be or who they are. The quality of Ubuntu gives people resilience. It enables them to survive and emerge still human despite all efforts to dehumanize them. I think that really collectively sets up the underpinning concepts of what we're trying to achieve in 
trying to achieve equality, um, and particularly through who we are individually. That's really powerful, isn't it? Mm. And what do you see as the connection between journalism and collective individualism? So journalism, um, e effectively storytelling. And I think an understanding what story actually is is really important. When I mean, we talk about storytelling, but we very rarely actually stop and pull it apart and decide, work out what it actually is. I, I believe that story is the most important thing that we have. So you can strip everything from somebody. You can take them, they can take their job away, their home away, their family. You can take the clothes off their back. You can take their identity, their country. You can take their freedom. But what you can never take from somebody is their story. It's the very essence of who we are. Um, and, and journalism is a, um, a craft whereby actually we, I, I feel very passionately, yes, we do all the things that we're meant to do, particularly in investigative. We hold power to account. We shout out corruption. <laughs> and um, we expose, we bring revelation to audiences. And we do that through a, a, a craft that has you know, a bunch of skill sets and learning along the way, how to do it and not to do it frequently, the way to go. But fundamentally, it's a huge, I see you, it's a huge responsibility and a privilege because you are holding the very essence of somebody by telling their story. You, uh, the elements of um, compassion and integrity, um, impartiality and not judgment in telling people's stories is really, really important. The idea of treating others how you would want to be treated yourself is absolutely fundamental to journalism um, and storytelling. And as a craft, we take a whole bunch of information, quite often very complex <laughs> information, and we distill it all down and turn it into something that is understandable for a particular target audience. And you need to understand your audience in order to communicate with them correctly. Those of you in you know, marketing or legal, you have to make a case or you have to connect with somebody in some way. That's what you, you are trying to do, is understand how your audience um, will consume your output effectively and target it correctly. And that's very much what we're doing. You know, those people who listen to the TAID programme on Radio 4 this morning are not going to be watching BBC Three um, later on online. Do you know what I mean? There's a, oh, they might <laughs> watch more. But, you know, different audiences require different things. And um, the way that it, it, it um, all comes together in terms of this idea of collective individualism and equality is that we are taking issues globally and turning them into stories because issues are just too big uh, and difficult <laughs> to um, get people to connect and engage with. Uh, you know, you can say education, healthcare, and people go, uh-huh. Turn it into a story gives it a face, enables you to connect in, in an appropriate way for you, with you as an audience. And that's, that's our craft. And that is what the very essence is in terms of taking individuals and collectively bringing together to demonstrate an issue. Does that make sense? <laughs> and what issues have you experienced firsthand that have led to inequality? Plenty. <laughs> so I, um, I just wanted to give you a little, a quick set the framework, which is a very, very generally, and I give you go to work, yay. Um, I hate PowerPoint. You set it up beautifully, and then it never quite does what you're expecting it to do. But here we go. I just wanted to just set the context, kind of globally this applies, particularly to women. I'm going to unpick it, but with men. I'm sure many of you have seen these as the Red Cross figures. But um, just to kind of set us in context globally, if you've got food in your fridge, clothes on your back, a roof over your head and a place to sleep, you're richer than 75% of the world. That's, it's a lot. And uh, I just heads up right at the top of this. We use figures a lot. Everyone uses figures. You guys probably use much more factually correct figures than we do as journalists. <laughs> We, uh, in dealing with the world, it is grey, it's not black and white. It is very difficult to um, extract um, figures when dealing with humanity. So obviously these are, um, these are global estimates from recognised organisations, but hey, give or take. Um, if you've got money in the bank, your wallet, some spare change, you're among the top 8% of the world's wealthy. So those of us who whinge we haven't quite got enough cash at the moment to go on holiday or whatever. We are in the top 8% of the world. I, it just puts into context quite in, uh, uh, inequality is way more than we realize. If you woke up this morning with more health than happiness, you are more blessed than the million people who are not going to survive this week. 
If you've never experienced the danger of battle, the agony of imprisonment or torture, or the horrible pangs of starvation, you are luckier than 500 million people alive and suffering right now. We're sitting here having a lovely chat, having just had bacon and egg roll. They were delicious, thank you, and a nice cup of coffee. There's 500 million people right now who don't have anything to eat, like the, uh, are, are suffering um, in these ways. If you can read this message, which probably some at the back maybe can't, <laughs> if you can read it, you are f more fortunate than three billion people who cannot read at all in the world. Now those are numbers. <laughs> and going back to the previous question, in terms of journalism and storytelling, they're quite impacting, but what we need to do is take those and turn those issues into stories that people understand. Um, there are... Um, the other key point, I think, is that every single issue in the world is utterly inextricably linked. You, although we divide them out, we have NGOs and organisations and projects and what have you and charities for particular areas and, and issues in the world, poverty, education, trafficking and slavery, um, natural disaster, migrants, refugees, etc. Actually, they're all utterly inextricably linked. Um, so, for example, uh, climate change and food insecurity. Climate change, obviously, a big, big game play at the moment. It's estimated by 2050, there'll be an extra two billion people on the planet. What that means in terms of food is that at current rates of production, we need to up it by 70%. Now, given that what is happening in terms of climate change and many other issues going on, and people are aware of the locust plague swarming across East Africa right now, you know, there's so much going on in the world which is threatening our food security, and yet we have to find another 70% by 2050. It actually impacts not only us and our families and our workplaces, but actually we impact the greater world as well because we have this inextricable human connection and all these issues are interlinked, which means that everything comes together as a whole. We can't pull it all out. Understanding the effect of um, emergencies, particularly on women, it is um, hugely important because they're actually at a double disadvantage. Two big elements are poverty and discrimination affect women globally, particularly in emergencies, particularly in conflict. The other thing is, is gender discrimination um, uh, and gender-based violence. And this can be sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, um, traditional um, harmful practices. Um, rape as a weapon of war is a major element. This is, this is something that has been used for thousands and thousands of years, and it's only relatively in recent times, the last couple of decades, that we've really identified it and named it as a weapon of war. During um, Rwanda, the genocide in Rwanda, a quarter of a million women in 100 days were raped. It is a tool utilised to dehumanise people. <laughs> to dehumanise families, communities, to ostracise, to isolate, and, and biologically brutalise um, lines, generations and lines and ethnic um, differences. And my goodness what that does to women. I mean, you know, we, we, we know how serious rape an issue is, but think about it on that mass scale. It's just, it's just terrific. So, but all these things, again, are interlinked. Food insecurity means that you flee. Frequently, your husbands are gone to fight somewhere else. You are vulnerable, you have children. That means you are less mobile, often with small people. Women bear the responsibility in many of the places where these issues are most acute for the home, for food, for water, <laughs> for children, for everything else. And so we really need to, I think, as a... Um, first place in, in understanding how issues create inequality, understand how they impact um, women first and foremost. Um, maternal health and infant health is another enormous one. I made a film years ago in very right up in the north of um, Afghanistan in an area called Badakhshan where maternal mortality was the highest in the world, the highest rate in the world. Um, and there were at the time two and a half thousand midwives for a population of 30 million people. So 50 women a day were dying in childbirth, kind of needlessly. And that was a really interesting place because on top of the lack of provision of health care, which is the obvious thing, cultural and social practices played into it in terms of issues of inequality for women. So right up in that very conservative area of Afghanistan, women, uh, another man was not allowed to see a man's wife. 
Unfortunately, women were not educated up there, so there are no female doctors. So if you're in trouble in childbirth, all the male doctors aren't allowed to see you because traditionally you're not allowed to see another man. Two and a half thousand midwives spread across, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and also they had practices where you, to give birth, you had to squat over a holes because it was believed. So basically, if you were hemorrhaging, worst place to be. And, and newborn babies were put in cattle dung to keep them warm. Yeah, good idea in principle, but <laughs> not ideal with our, you know, sanitation knowledge, etc. So inequality carries through so many different traditional uh, social, cultural practices, as well as um, economic um, and conflict and, and situations of climate change, etc., etc. Everything is utterly inextricably linked. Let's have a film clip. <laughs> we'll make it a little bit heavier. Um, I want to just talk. Um, I've got a clip for you about um, child labour because I think children are our key, obviously, our future. Is everyone okay? Is anyone need coffee already? <laughs> Vodka. <laughs> Do you know what the brilliant thing about doing foreign affairs is that you know it's a tropic somewhere in the world, so you can always go, oh, they're having a GNT, <laughs> I'll have one keep company. Um, th this is a film um, in Malawi. I just wanted to pick up child labour briefly because uh, um, all of these issues end up, as I said, the world is grey. Um, we end up with an awful lot of children working where in an ideal world they wouldn't, you know. Um, just have a look at this little clip and we'll talk about it afterwards. This is nine-year-old Lisa. She and her sister suffer from severe headaches, symptoms of nicotine poisoning. Like thousands of children, they work with tobacco for up to 12 hours a day. Tobacco that's bought by major cigarette manufacturers and sold to smokers around the world. They also say their kids work to beat them, sometimes with their hands and sometimes with sticks. We've come to Malawi to meet the children who suffer because of the world's addiction to tobacco. Um, so this was a film made quite some time ago. This is a nine-year-old leafer. When they pick tobacco, um, you, uh, they absorb the nicotine through their fingers. It's the equivalent to smoking 40 Marlboro Reds a day which is why they suffer headaches and severe health issues. The other thing being they get yellow stained fingers. They then, even if they do get time to go to school, they don't go because they're stigmatized as the tobacco kids because they've got yellow fingers. Um, and and this, is, um, this is a little while ago, this film, but you know, we talk about child labor, but this is little Leafa. This is her future. She's not getting into school. Right now, there's 130 billion girls who are not ever going to get an education. This is the latest, again, we love figures, but, you know, it, it gives you a context, give or take. Um, these are children that um, were beaten by their uh, farm owners. And then why I show you this as an example, it carries, uh, it, these issues carry through many commodities. So um, cocoa is exactly the same um, setup. These are kids doing tobacco as well. Um, this is Leafa's little sister. Um, she was eight. Um, horrific headaches. Um, Cocoa is an industry that has huge problems with child labour. Um, these kids suffer horrific injuries using machetes, they're not in school. But the problem is their families are poor and the way that a lot of these things are set up, coffee's another one, Nespresso and Starbucks, you might have got caught out re um, by dispatches for using child labour on their farms in Honduras. Um, the issue here is, again, it's, it's grey. These families are poor tenant farmers and the problem with commodities is there isn't a clear supply chain. With the, to with the uh, tobacco leaves and the cocoa, you, when it gets to market, you've got absolutely no idea which bean or which leaf came from which farm because a, a, t a farmer owns the land, they have tenant farmers, big cooperative, it all gets mixed up together at market, no idea. And the, and the um, supply chain issue being transparent is a huge challenge for many industries, but this is the impact. So collectively, we, in creating equality for these kids and these parents, the heart, I spent weeks living with this family in um, the Ivory Coast. And the, the mothers are heartbroken that their kids are doing this and getting injured and not going to school. But they have no choice because if they don't work, they don't meet quotas, which means they're off the farm and they starve. Is it, you know, what is the alternative? As industries and individuals, we need to stand up and call out for alternative. Industries are going to have to take a cut to profits. Well, bad luck. We might have to pay more for our chocolate and our coffee. But actually, what do we really care about? 
these are the faces that I'm talking about in terms of collective individualism. These are the individuals collectively we need to come together and, and help. Um, the other, just to touch on quickly, the other big thing about child labour is inextricably linked with um, trafficking and slavery. Um, those, uh, those are very, very big issues. This little kid was in Nepal. We made a film about um, child labour in um, garment factories. He, uh, we actually had stopped filming for a day. We were just filming generally in an area and he came and sat next to us, and sat next to our translator and said, I saw you and um, I figured you'd be my way out. He'd escaped, he'd run away, sat next to her and said, you have to take me because the owner beats me of the factory and I won't survive if you don't take me with you now. Um, issues of intervention, whole other, <laughs> other chat. But we had a, a charity worker with us. Long story short, we tracked his story. He'd been stolen from his village in India, trafficked into Nepal and was trapped in slave labor. He worked 6 a.m. till 10 p.m., slept on the floor of the factory and did the same thing every day. Every single day, we reunited him with his family. That became a really big issue. Trafficking turned into a really powerful story following him through to his parents who had no idea where he'd disappeared to one day. Absolutely no idea. Um, he was a gorgeous little boy. Um, same again, same story. These, this girl and Pramila, her sister, they were enslaved in bonded labor in Nepal. Um, they were orphans, they'd been taken from their orphanage. Um, during the film, we um, managed to go and find the sister and release her and reunite them. They were put into care and given an education and moved on. We need to help each individual. These big fat figures we give you when we talk about slavery and trafficking, etc., are not just big fat figures. They're people, they're children, they're daughters, they're, you know. Um, and, and it's a very powerful thing to be able to um, deliver that. Slavery is um, predominantly in, in Africa. Um, one of the big issues is increasing violent conflict over the last 30 years has made it much easier to occur. Um, and although it's illegal in every single country in the world, <laughs> it's um, flourishing. In 2018, I'll just give you the number, 170 countries had public commitments to eradicate it, um, but only 122 have actually criminalised it in line with the UN guidelines. Um, the other element of slavery is forced marriage, big issue for women. Um, only 38 countries have criminalised forced marriage in the world. So. We've got a lot of work to do <laughs> together individually, but also when it comes to sort of legal um, and discourse um, and justice. But actually, it's fundamentally about each and every one of us and these communities changing our worldviews. That's fundamentally. So looking at the issues of the tobacco industry and the coffee industry, or the, the, um, the cocoa industry, what can we do as consumers to affect change? You know, do we vote with our pockets or do we sign petitions? I mean, how can we actually yeah. do something to, to help impact that? Uh, all of them. Right. <laughs> all of them. I think core to this, absolutely core to it, is um, this, this idea of um, we need to challenge ourselves first mm -hmm. and fundamentally. Um, we've got to challenge ourselves to change our world views of actually what this means and how we play a part. We need to challenge others who are working in those communities. As a journalist and a storyteller, my job is to challenge, <laughs> is I, I view my job to challenge people to change their view on things. And it's at every single level through the structure um, of issues and things that happen. Um, um, an example, which I've prepared for you, <laughs> challenging worldviews, obviously, um, is child marriage. So when I was talking about as a, as a craft in journalism, what we're trying to do when we connect with an audience is achieve something called the head to heart shift. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all, anyone in marketing terms or whatever. When people watch something or, or consume a story or reading or you're listening or watching a film, um, particularly today, these days, we're doing hundreds of things at the same time. Right? And we're watching with our heads because we're also cooking dinner or you know replying to something or thinking, oh, I must write that down for tomorrow, whatever. Um, and uh, we, we're just watching with our heads. A good storyteller enables you to shift from watching something from your head to your heart and your gut. 
When you start engaging with your heart and your gut with something, with a story, that's when change happens. That's when you somehow internalise a change in your world view about something. When I say world view, I mean in terms of your attitudes, your knowledge, your preconceptions. Challenge them. Challenge your stereotyping, challenging your ideas about what things are really about. Um, and as storytellers, we're constantly, to our target audience, trying to challenge people to shift to engaging with their heart and their gut. And uh, you know, Even when I take uh, films to Parliament, um, uh, which I have a number of films, and actually the next one I'll, I'll show you um, when, and actually did impact um, some change, but we're trying to get people to stop playing with their mobile phones <laughs> and go, oh my gosh, that's actually a person. That's actually somebody, that could be my child, or that could be my wife, or my husband, or, you know. And that is the only way we'll achieve equality, is when people start engaging with their guts and their hearts. Um, child marriage is um, um, a huge issue for girls, obviously. Our future <laughs> is young girls right now, and they're the ones we need to fight for in terms of pushing the equality um, debate forward. One in five girls um, globally are married before the age of 18. Um, that's 12 million girls a year get married early. What's the impact of that? Well, it impacts education um, and economic empowerment. I'll talk about as well at some point, but at some point, lots of other things this morning. Economic empowerment is fundamental, and girls need education to be able to, uh, to do that, to break these cycles and get out of it. Um, Africa has um, uh, got particularly high rates, also Bangladesh. Nigeria has very high rates. The other thing, uh, the thing about child marriage, um, in Nigeria, they commonly marry at the ages of 12, 13, 14, so pretty young. Um, they, Nigeria has the highest maternal mortality rate in Africa. Um, if you, um, you're five times more likely to die in childbirth under the age of 15. So there's an issue of dying in childbirth. The other big thing, um, and, and in Africa, a third of those dying in childbirth are adolescent girls. So um, the other big issue is um, uh, fistula. So anyone know what fistula is? Yeah, it's. Um, it's basically it, when, when a, a tearing occurs, which creates a, um, a channel between two structures in the body that shouldn't be there. So basically giving birth, it's, you know, simply put, is a massive tearing, which for young girls has a huge impact um, on their lives. Let me just show you a clip. I promise you I won't leave you depressed. I really promise I won't. <laughs> Most cases of fistula happen to young girls during their first pregnancy. Dr. Case told me that nearly half of his patients are under 16 years old. How many patients do you have at the moment? At the moment, I think there's something like 150 to 200 patients. Right. How serious is this problem? I think it's a very serious problem, specifically sexual. You see, the male young, they get pregnant young. They deliver young, and they pick up the fist. And then for most of this, we don't talk to people. Um, to, um, uh, encompass traditional, any traditional sort of cultures or practices. So the government are actually powerless to implement it. And although they have now, they've seen a drop in a rate of about 9% in child marriage. But in the north of Nigeria, where it is very conservative Islamic, we made this film up in the area where uh, Boko Haram are um, now, just before that all happened and the girls were stolen. Um, uh, up there, the rate is something like 76% is child marriage. In the southeast, it's about 10%. So, you know, as a country, a, a legal uh, a government has implemented a countrywide law, but so difficult to enforce it. We spoke to, um, in a village, we spoke to all the men. We gathered them together and said, <laughs> how many of you have lost daughters or wives, etc., because of this? Over half of them put their hands up. We spoke to an 84-year-old man who'd married a 14-year-old two weeks before and said, really? <laughs> And he said, you know what, the government can introduce any law they like, but frankly, this is how we do it, and who's going to enforce it out here? This is our way of life. They can't interfere with it. We spoke to a moderate cleric who said, um, in Islam, it is fine to marry at any age. You mustn't consummate the marriage until the child is deemed physically and mentally ready. Well, who chooses when they are physically and mentally ready? So we really need to challenge worldviews, both 
in these communities um, as well as us and outside. We took this film actually to Parliament and um, it, was, uh, it was raised as a question in the European Parliament and there was more pressure put on the Nigerian government to try and help it. But, you know, a very complicated place and, and a slight aside, a really complicated place where the conflict between the Christian South um, and the Islamic North. We were allocated a government minder when we arrived who was sent up from um, Lagos and she was um, Buxom Christian lady with a very low cut top and we were filming during Ramadan right in the conservative north and she sat in the back of our minibus singing Jesus loves you songs at the top of her voice sort of bouncing around so to put it with our fixer and our driver in the front in Ramadan fasting huge challenges when you're filming to not upset people you know I'm carrying a hundred kilos worth of kit I film all of these myself there's only me and the reporter um, thinking about Image, sound, can I edit it? Are we okay? I'm responsible for everyone's safety as well. What's going on? Have we got the right questions? Can I cut that? All going on at the same time and I'm not allowed to drink any water <laughs> during the day and it was 36 degrees. So I'd hide in the bottom of the minibus <laughs> with a break swig or whatever. But the conflict that we saw just in our minibus <laughs> between two people of one country who supposedly should be working together to solve these kind of very difficult social and very grey issues. All the runners are back. <laughs> Here comes the Orange Brigade. Yay! <laughs> well done, ladies. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so really, really interesting. But the whole point is challenging each of us individually, but also in these society is challenging views, perceptions, stereotypes, allowing space and debate and change to happen. Um, but it's got to be underpinned with a really robust and fair justice system. And unfortunately, that falls down an awful lot of the time in many places. I think everybody in this room probably shifted from engaging with their head to engaging with their heart with that clip. I mean, that's powerful and pretty overwhelming and I think from from being here in London we feel quite powerless to affect any change but um, that's why this is so fascinating because there's so much that we can do yeah. in a small way um, but shifting to justice as you just introduced you've yeah. experienced firsthand the impact of inequality in the justice system these are the girls I knew I'd talk too much and forget <laughs> this is Ramita and I filming in Nigeria uh, in the villages um, and these are the, some of the girls we met. So just going back to faces as well. Yeah. This is what, um, and they walk around with their little um, tubs because of the incontinence, which just can't be solved. The smell is really overpowering, particularly in the heat. Flies, you know, if you think it through, um, really hitting. Experience firsthand the impact of inequality in the justice yep. system. Um, can you elaborate on your exposure to that? Yeah. With, um, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. So Hurricane Katrina back in 2005, and I'll rattle through this because I know we're we're running on time already. Um, uh, when it hit, I read a very small article in the newspaper by a uh, human rights lawyer called Clive Stafford Smith. He ran an organisation called Reprieve in Reprieve. Can you say that? in New Orleans which fights to overturn wrongful conviction. Um, Louisiana is known as the king of incarceration. It incarcerates at double the rate of the, the US and um, um, over half of those who are incarcerated haven't actually been convicted of any crime yet. So it's kind of the extreme of, you know, justice um, and legal system. And when, Louis, when Hurricane Katrina hit, what they did was um, shut down the prison. So when the entire city was evacuated, the prison containing around 7,400 uh, 7, um, or so prisoners um, got locked into their cells in the lowest line part of the city, which traditionally flooded anyway, which was an interesting choice. Um, I, uh, and I read this little article that said, we haven't been into our offices for the reprie reprieve organization. Um, we have no idea of the evidence we have been collecting uh, which proves that people are innocent or proves that people are guilty and gets someone off who's been convicted who's actually innocent is all okay. And a lot of it is obviously very sensitive, DNA, evidence, etc. Um, the rates of overturning uh, convictions based on post-conviction DNA evidence is extremely high. Um, th there was an estimate in 2014 which um, came up with the figures that about 1 in 25 of those in, um, convicted are innocent. Um, over there. Anyway, um, 
so I, I convinced um, this world at the BBC to let me go out to New, Orle New Orleans, and I got on a plane two weeks after the city had um, been drained, and there was one hotel open, because the whole city was shut down. I mean, it was empty, there was no power, there was nothing, but there was one hotel that had generators and was bringing food in for journalists. There was a BBC cameraman who'd been doing new stuff coming out. I took his hire car, his hotel room, and my flight was delayed into um, Baton Rouge, and I drove down into uh, New Orleans. It was dead. I had no idea where I was going. I was trying to follow one-way streets, wrong way, upside down, all the rest, and I pulled up at a stop sign, and a massive Humvee pulled up next to me. There was an eight o'clock curfew at the time, and it was five to eight. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is going to be a great film. I've got to get arrested before I even start. <laughs> and I looked up, and there was a soldier, two soldiers looking down. They looked down at me, and I went, hello, <laughs> and I drove off. <laughs> I just sat there and went, strange. Um, Anyway, I spent months, in the end, I spent the best part of nine months coming and going from Louisiana investigating what had happened in the prison. Um, this is New Orleans Parish Prison. They hold all the prisoners there. The courthouse is also uh, attached to it. Um, and if you get arrested um, in, in, New Orleans, in Louisiana, life is, is life. You will die in prison. That's it. And they have, obviously, the death penalty there as well. So when the hurricane hit, it took them three days to then boat out six or seven prisoners at a time, all 7,500 of them, to an overpass. They'd stood for three days in water up to here, full of sewage and everything else that's on the streets of Louisiana. They then sat in over 100 degrees heat. Dark, dark, black-skinned men were peeling from sunburn sitting like this. They then got scattered around the county. The problem was nobody knew who anybody was because there was a three-day-old paper list of who'd come out of the prison. They put them all into massive exercise yards in different prisons and two female defence attorneys turned up, <laughs> Julie Kilborn and, and Phyllis Mann, and they said, right, in their lovely Louisiana accents, we're going to sort this out. And they literally worked through every single person on the list to work out who was who. You could have been arrested for reading tarot cards, sleeping on the sidewalk, uh, alcohol in your hand in a street, mixed up with people who had been convicted and were um, of rape and lots of gang culture in, in New Orleans. It's a very poor and deprived place, lots of social issues. Um, and they'd literally open the gate and everyone rattled to the gate and they'd say, who are you? Oh, I'm just in on a traffic violation. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you know, They had to work out who everyone was. It was in America. It was extraordinary. No one knew. They'd literally throw sandwiches over the fence. The women uh, got taken to a prison called Angola, which is their state penitentiary. I don't know if anyone's heard of Angola. It is so enormous it has its own zip codes. Um, and if someone tries to escape, they release wolves on them to hunt them down and find them. An extraordinary place. Um, and that's where they hold death row. And I went to visit um, the women who had been um, taken to Angola of all the prisons to choose. And um, they literally, all male <laughs> state penitentiary, they had no idea what to do with them or how to look after them at all. There was a woman we found in there who, um, it turned out she had been released on paper, but no one had physically walked to her cell and never let her out. So had Hurricane Katrina not happened, she would never have left prison. Because everybody says, I'm not meant to be in here from the bars. And every guard goes, yeah, right, you and everybody else in here. So Katrina cracked open the entire justice system and what happens there. Um, and now the key element was that the public defenders, who represent 85% of defendants there, that's how poor it is, um, four out of five of them left during Hurricane Katrina. So there were four public defenders looking after over 600 cases, including a dozen capital crime cases. And in Louisiana, public defenders are, are paid by a system peculiar to Louisiana, which is by traffic fines. <laughs> no one was driving in New Orleans. It was empty. There were no traffic fines. There was no money in the system. This whole self-perpetuating system, I could talk to you about it for hours, but so what's been said. It, it, some of it has been, right. but the really interesting impact is, <laughs> this is them all on the um, <coughs> side for, have a look at this clip. This is where the evacuated prisoners were meant to appear, Orleans Parish Criminal Courthouse, the front of the prison complex. For all its grandeur, it's brought neither law nor order to a city notorious for murder. The senior judge was Calvin Johnson. At one point in, in this court's history, we were trying more cases in this building than any other court in Louisiana. And we had judges in this building, including me, actually, who uh, year in and year out would try more murder trials than any other judges, any other judge in America.
This is how the courthouse looked when Katrina struck. It stayed closed for nine months, with makeshift courts elsewhere hearing only a fraction of the normal caseload, leaving judges with a backlog of over 6,000 cases. Katrina blew the system apart, and it made it such that we were so disconnected that we simply could not function. It seems extraordinary in a building prone to flooding that vital forensic evidence was stored in the basement. The fate of thousands of defendants now rests on evidence in these rooms. Rape kits and weapons. Film. This was the BBC's anniversary film. Uh, it did divert funds down to try and sort out the criminal justice system in Louisiana, but you know, long way to go. And, and that's America. Think about the equivalent justice systems in many of the other places we're talking about. Um, a lot of these issues. Um, shocking to think that that was only how many years ago? 2005, six. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not that long ago. 15 years ago, and mm. it was that behind in terms of how they're reporting. Yeah. Just shifting to uh, your experience covering war and conflict, what um, what has been your exposure um, working on the front line and how, with the cycle of conflict, can we break that? Um, war is always the sort of fun stuff that people want to hear about <laughs> in lots of different ways. Um, I've done quite a variety of um, war and conflict. People are always really interested in the Afghanistan stuff. As a journalist, that was a really difficult conflict to cover. We had 13 years to keep an audience engaged. <laughs> And increasingly, as time went on, you know, there was a lot more political apathy for a war that was bringing home sons, daughters in body bags and spending money where it should be spent on the NHS and, and you know, education, not something very far away. Um, and 18 years on, you know, we've still got 1,100 troops in Kabul now um, working in Afghanistan. Um, it, it's a really interesting place. This is, I've brought you a few photos she would actually is like to work in. This is, this is my tent on many occasions. I spent several months working um, in Afghan on different films following uh, different people. As a woman, in terms of a back to the equality thing, <laughs> as in a workplace, it's really interesting to be a female working in places like this. You, um, it, <laughs> challenging perceptions and stereotypes not judging books by covers is, is a big mantra for me because people often very quickly judge me um, with no idea actually of what I have and haven't done. I, um, I stupidly and should have known a lot better. I married into the military. My husband's in the army. <laughs> Back when we got married, the longest time we spent together in one place was in Camp Bastion. Um, but he's medical corps, so he was based in the hospital and it was me going out on patrol. He lent me his bomb-proof pants, which was very kind of him. <laughs> I know, it's so nice. <laughs> He'll love me, love me sharing that with you all. Um, but, um, and I, I go to military functions now, so this is where I get really cross. And um, I am apparently an army wife. My pass calls, it says, dependent. I'm a dependent on my pass. And um, I will sit at these functions and lots of people with all their medals. And um, people say to me, so how's your next move going? I'm like, well, we move in July. That will be our sixth address in seven years. It's quite hard going, actually, with two small children, schools, life, trying to have a career <laughs> around that. And I, you know, the military thing is a really interesting thing about identity and equality. There's a whole other one I'm <laughs> quite champing on. There's a bunch of women trying to work really hard to um, target and harness the skill sets that are currently lying latent and waiting to be tapped into because we work in a system that believes that military wives are still in the 50s and all they do is look after the home. And I sit at dinners and go, well, you'll find that in so-and-so, whatever happened in Kandahar or Bastion. And I go, oh, really? I didn't find that. And people are like, <laughs> I was like, I deployed more times than you did. So please take your crusty ideas away. <laughs> um, not always. I'm stereotyping, obviously, and generalizing. But, uh, you know, it's really interesting being a, a sort of smallish female. I don't, I, I don't carry the sort of authority that people would expect someone that does this job to do. I've got size three feet, for goodness sake, you know, and I'm trotting <laughs> after six foot something men. Um, so uh, how we are perceived as women is a massive thing in terms of equality. It's how we apply to all the issues in the clips we've already seen. You know, we've got to challenge stereotypes amongst us 
and then out there with our, our counterparts, our women, our men. And I'm afraid m women and men do it as much as. It's not always men that just assume that I'm, I'm my wife at home. I remember taking my son Oliver to his first swimming lessons and the swimming teacher, I said, oh, hello, my name's Julie and this is Oliver. And she said, oh, I don't need to know your name. You're Oliver's mum. <laughs> I was like, oh, right, <laughs> okay. So we've got to call out yeah. at every opportunity where we are labelled because language is so important. Um, in, in conflict, I'll just come back to this in a second, but conflict, enemies are created in societies by demonising others and enabling them to become them and us good and evil. And that starts with language. Um, during the Rwandan genocide, the Hutus called the Tutsis cockroaches. Illegal aliens in America. I've made films on the border in America where I have met one particular woman, this tiny little woman called Nelba. She had a tiny little orange T-shirt, tiny bottle of water. She was about to cross the border. Frankly, it was the most dangerous place I've worked, the border, the drug running border between Mexico and America, talking to migrants who were about to cross. And she was about to do three days across the desert um, because her little two-year-old needed a better life and she couldn't feed him. This isn't an illegal alien as labelled. The them and us language is very, very powerful. Um, language followed by image. We are hardwired as human beings to accept what we hear and accept what we see. To over override our hardwiring and question is the biggest thing you can all do in terms of a call to action and really ask, what's missing from that? Is that which voice is missing? and who's telling me what they're telling me are the most perceptive things you can do in terms of challenging stereotyping and challenging um, what we're seeing. So um, going into places like this is, is really interesting <laughs> as a female. Um, this is going out on patrol on, on Highway 1. Um, and, you know, physically, it's blooming hard work. I was a lot stronger and fitter then. <laughs> I am now, two children later and feeling a bit wobbly on the insides. Um, <laughs> But um, I had to overcome a lot of stereotyping. When you fly into Kandahar, it starts. I flew from the first time I went out to covering the whole conflict. The very first time I arrived, um, I was doing a film where I spent two months embedded with Chinook pilots who were flying out and picking up injured soldiers in battle, bringing them back to the um, hospital. And um, when we, we, we flew in, we flew into Kandahar, because at that time you couldn't fly directly to Camp Bastion. And um, you, they, you put your full body armour on in the plane, they turn all the lights off. This is a massive plane moving a lot of troops and they land very fast in pitch black. And the little 18, I say little, I don't mean that, <laughs> but he was really short. 18 year old soldier who'd never deployed, held my hand in the dark. He was terrified. It was the first time he'd ever been away from his training. It was the first time out. And the lights came on, he let go very, very quickly. Um, but it just, you know, it is the most extraordinary thing. And people, as a, as a woman, assume that you are the weaker element. But my goodness, we make extraordinary films because when men talk to women, they talk about their heart, particularly in war zones. If you watch films that have been made by men, you get a very different film to a film that's been made by a woman. Um, you have to keep up with them, though, and they all tend to be six foot four, which is really annoying. <laughs> this is being out on um, um, patrol. This is, body armor weighs 10 kilos. So um, we, we, when I flew in the very first time and I went in on a Chinook, we landed in the dark, got earplugs in, all the rotors are going because you're sitting, sitting duck target basically. Grabbed the rucksack of the man in front of me, dropped off the back of the Chinook, which he just leisurely stepped down and I hit the deck because my legs are far too short. <laughs> full kit, two sets of cameras, um, full body armor, my sleeping bag, the lot. I had a hand-drawn map of some tents. This is Camp Bastion. And I, I walked around Camp Bastion going, excuse me, could you tell me where to find Major So-and-so, please? That was my introduction. Uh, 10 years later, when I did my last embed, I flew in on an international flight, landed on one of the two international length runways, fully lit, got in a vehicle, and it took 40 minutes to drive the perimeter of, of Camp Bastion. It was the size of Reading. That was the scale of the conflict over, over a lot of time. Um, um, so in, filming in the desert. So this is the, some of the Chinook stuff um, and going into battle to pick up casualties. At the time, if you were um, 2008-9, at the height of the casualties, this is bringing them back and briefing, flying on the uh, Chinooks. Um, at the height of um, casualty levels, Camp Bastion Trauma Hospital was the busiest trauma hospital in the world. If you made it alive from the battlefield back to the hospital, these are the medics on board working on casualties. If you made it back to the hospital, you had a 99% survival rate. 
who was really extraordinary medicine. This is my colleague who got shot coming out of an ambulance at the back. That's another story. I won't start that one now. Longest seven minutes of my life waiting for him to come in, thinking I really don't want to phone his mum. I really don't want to phone his mum. Luckily, I didn't. He was shot through the knee and he was fine in the end. But, um, yeah, I got to finish all his films for him because he went home and had a jolly nice time in hospital. But he was fine. Um, but conflict in places like South Sudan, which I'm very passionate about and spent a lot of time in, is a very different place to work. Everyone assumes Afghanistan's dangerous. Actually, no, the whole British Army are looking after you. And if you get hurt, they'll all come pick you up and take you home. You're fine. When you start working in places like that, this is when um, conflict is much more interesting. Um, I, I'm a, obviously, I'm a hostile environment specialist. I've done so much training, it's not funny. Um, in, and I now teach journalists how to work in hostile environments. I'm very aware of myself and in terms of working in risk um, I know my limits I know my thresholds of trauma my thresholds of risk I've learned them <laughs> over 20 years of doing this I know exactly when it's time for me to stop or pull back I'm not capable anymore the skill in working in these areas is understanding other people's thresholds of trauma and risk your duty of care to your crew and the contributors you're working with the contributors you work with deal with risk all the time. People are like, oh, is that not really scary doing that? This is South Sudan working with the UN forces. We've got a lot of British troops working with the UN in South Sudan now. It is a conflict that has gone on over and over and over. This is Mary. Um, her five grandchildren were all killed when this village was attacked um, and they shot. They were all asleep in their little hut. Um, you know, these cycles impact women more than anything else. So in South Sudan, conflict, of course, um, fleeing of millions of people. Food insecurity becomes the next issue. These are women we met at a, 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 U, um, a UN food drop. Um, they were literally eating grass. And when we arrived at this food drop, we waited three days for all of this grain to be handed out. Why? Because the social structure and cultural um, laws were that the heads of the village, the men, had to be here to authorise the releasing of the food. In those three days, and this is when they finally released it, when the men deemed to turn up, um, guess who did all the carrying and the lugging? <laughs> the women. <laughs> Off they went. <laughs> in the meantime, I was filming in the clinic that was makeshift of the starving children. Food was sitting there for three days and they couldn't access it. Um, we really need to think about sorting, you know, this very basic stuff out. This little kid who was on a feeding tube um, in, South, in South Sudan. And the children is the big thing. Breaking cycles of conflict is so much about children. It's about, as I said, breaking the process of dehumanisation. Um, and we also need to bear in mind that, um, as you know, I'll come back to that in a sec. Let me show you um, um, uh, a clip very quickly about this. Uh, about the children. Children always suffer the most alongside the women in conflict and for some unexpected reasons. Go. We've heard accounts of children being kidnapped, being raped. Child abductions has always happened during cattle rustling here, but the numbers have increased significantly. We travelled to Bor, the capital of Jongli State, to visit a home for children who have been recently rescued from their captors. hold the emotion and the feeling. These children are holding the emotion and the feeling. We all do, but for children. 
The other out of these are all children who were from this place. The other element that's really interesting is that muscles have memory. I don't know how much you know about this. You, you actually hold trauma in your, mem in your muscle memory. So children who have suffered great trauma often, and actually adults, <laughs> will, if you have suffered trauma, your muscles in replaying the trauma will demonstrate physically the trauma. The other thing that I think is really crucial and fascinating to find out more about um, is the fact that right now there's a whole load of controversial but research going on and it's now been widely accepted that trauma is passed on genetically through generations. Um, Epigenetics is, is it's like a chemical tagging happens. It doesn't alter the d DNA itself. There's a chemical tagging that happens in trauma, and that gets passed on. It's really interesting. If you're interested, go and have a look at the research. But in humans, we're looking at it. It's been shown through various studies of, of um, children separated from families in Pakistan and places. Lots of studies in mice, which we use for a lot of the studies on genetics in humans, um, to equate, has shown that it, trauma can be passed on up to five generations. We have to <laughs> step up and start thinking about, first and foremost, our language that we use in terms of breaking the cycles of conflict, stopping dehumanization. We need to rehumanize. We need to put faces to issues to rehumanize. We need to use good language. And this is all of us. We need to do it with our families, our friends, our workplace. If you work in you know, teams, you do lots of stuff which is all about team building. It's all about empowering, finding people's gifts, getting them out there. It's the same principle. What you do in your workplace and all of your lovely leadership training and you know, getting people to be the best they can. A team needs every single person to play their individual unique part and they've all got to be different otherwise nothing happens. All of us need to kind of take on board our own sense of self-worth in order to step up and have a voice and that involves us all being quite vulnerable actually. These kids have got to learn how to be vulnerable because the way they protect their hearts is shutting down. And you know we, we put walls up when we, we protect ourselves but actually taking away the vulnerability doesn't enable them to deal with the trauma. And if trauma is not dealt with in a healthy way, for us, therapy, brilliant. For them, how do we do this? But if you don't deal with it, epigenetics is taking it down the generations. So we have to break cycles because the conflict, breaking that, is interlinked, go back to the beginning, with our issues of climate change, food insecurity, slavery, trafficking, all the things we care about actually all come down to a sense of us belonging and empowering each other to step up on our own unique skills, talents and ability to impact everyone else. Because we are all inextricably linked, completely. <laughs> Julie, thank you. That's an amazing call to action, I think, for all of us. And uh, an incredible summary for something that I think is probably going to stay with all of us for a very long time. You know, some of those film clips are utterly harrowing and it's quite incredible to see how so many of the world's population actually live yeah. and what they go through on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. And I think it makes us feel incredibly lucky and privileged. Can and I give you emotional a as well. So can I give you the uplifting bit? Yeah, please. <laughs> so here we go, when you go out today. Um, it's very quickly, oh, these are the kids. Um, does everybody, has everyone heard of Mary Colvin? Mm -hmm. She's an American journalist, wrote for the Times. She yeah. was killed in Syria, um, we believe targeted. Um, in Homs. When she died, her mother said her legacy was to be passionate and be involved in what you believe in. Do it as thoroughly and honestly and fearlessly as you can. I think that is the epitome of a call to action for all of us. She was an extraordinary woman. She absolutely, she should have already left Hobbs when she was killed. She stayed to get the one more story because she said it's worse than I've ever seen. I am not leaving. You know, in our own, we don't have to go to Homs and get killed, it's okay. But in our own individual ways, I think that that's a really strong, strong element. My other favourite thing, which is on my wall above my desk, keep me going on some days. Here we go. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world, because all things break. And all things can be mended. Not with time, they say, but with intention. So go, love intentionally, extravagantly, and unconditionally. The broken world waits in the darkness for the light that is you. That's every single one of you. We can all play our part. There is so much hope. Without hope, 
nothing changes. And all the stories of the people you've seen today have told me their stories because they believe in the power of Western media. They have made themselves vulnerable. A lot of them took great risk to talk to us because they believe that all of us will have our, our worldviews, our stereotyping, our perceptions of them and of each other challenged and find our voices. You just have to have a voice in your home, your family. It's like the stone on the pond. Chuck it out, you've no idea where the ripples go, but have faith that they'll go and hopefully some of them will be blooming great waves. Remember the snowflakes things from the, begin at the beginning. We're all intrinsically so unique and we should absolutely step into that because put us together, we'll be an avalanche in sorting out inequality somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. We've got time for a couple of quick questions. We're almost at 10 o'clock. Does anybody have anything they want to put to Billy? Any comments, any thoughts? Nikki? Yeah, completely different. I, I was um, I was 43 when I had Sam. Um, I'm 46 on Saturday, if anyone. <laughs> so I turn up and lots of people go, just don't assume. <laughs> I said, because I'm just a bit little and I just don't have that, you know. Um, and I, um, so I'd have, I've had a full kind of career prior to having children. And when I make these films, I am so focused on getting the best product and you have to think like that if you allow you have to have there's a tension there's a tension between um, emotion and understanding how much emotion to engage with in order to make an emotional film take an audience on an emotional journey uh, married with the tension of actually being professional and doing my job because if I fall apart there's absolutely no point in me doing it my end game is impact and if I can't do that then, and and as a filmmaker you're always thinking about Gosh, so much, as I said before, safety, picture, image, can I edit it? What has everyone eaten? Who's gonna pass out now? Can I watching our backs? I'm responsible for I do all our risk assessments, hundreds of pages of risk, and you never know. It's always the things you're unex not expecting that scupper you. When we were in Badakhshan in northern Af Afghanistan making the film about maternal mortality and um, hundreds of pages of risk assessment um, and I ticked in an earthquake zone didn't think about it I haven't had one for 40 years in the middle of the night we have an enormous earthquake so we're all, we're all standing in the doorway of our, our little tiny was really rural little tiny pension house going outside kidnapped inside crushed yeah inside crushed that's fine <laughs> you know you, you I am trained to do all of this but when I had children everything changed and now when I watch the clips my gut I always felt an empathetic person, I thought I was, and, until I had kids, but now I see my children in each of those faces. And it has really impacted. On a practical point, you know, uh, there's a few places I definitely wouldn't go to now that I did when I was, so didn't have the responsibilities I have. Um, and now I will do remote directing or series producing when it's not appropriate for me to go anymore. Um, but I'm also passionate about equipping new talent and making sure that other people go and learn from all the things I did wrong, primarily. So I teach on masters, journalism and conflict studies course and things. I teach them how to um, go navigate all of this and how to learn from the things that I got wrong so they can get it right. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else? Yep. In the UK, you know, we have HIV AIDS issues. Um, the Weinstein case sort of highlights all the ways that women were taken advantage of and nobody spoke out, even though they knew it was a case in AIDS. We have period poverty. Yep. Um, a friend of mine that works in the film industry has issues at the moment in terms of some of her male colleagues taking credit for her work. Oh, that's familiar. <laughs> so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well. I think uh, everything, it always it starts at home because your, your sense of self-worth and belief comes out of the, the family structure and sense of belonging, the most strongest and sort of primal place where that starts is the home and the society, which is why this it, children's stuff is so important. Yeah. Remove them and you're setting up for generations problems, let alone like the epigenetic stuff. 
Um, so that's uh, really, really important. And inequality in the UK is in amongst, obviously, we know it's amongst us all. I, I have worked on so many projects, and bear in mind I'm a freelance, so I have to negotiate each contract every time I go to it. Every single flipping time I find out later I've been paid a hell of a lot less than my male counterparts. I'm doing exactly the same job, exactly the same risk level, which frankly when you're Afghan in Afghan and you discover that your male counterpart uh, was earning about 400 pounds a week, more than me. It, yeah. And yeah, the production that. manager who I negotiated my contract with is a female. We need to look out for each other. I mean, it's a massive problem in the film industry, and particularly as freelancers. There's always just an assumption, because I'm a woman, I'm not the breadwinner. So therefore, I will just do everything out of the kindness of my heart. But actually, as a freelance, every ounce of my time is not paid for unless I invoice it, which I don't live in a structure that does that. And it's really interesting finding the tension, the balance between the things that you choose to do versus because you're passionate and that's, your, that's what you want to do and it's an element of extension of you. It doesn't matter what you do, you know, you guys go and do your running is part of that. Um, but what's interesting is the perception always that as a female, you are not the breadwinner and in a freelance industry, that's a really difficult um, challenge to go with. Just one thought on that. Um, in the UK, in terms of inequality, bear in mind tonight when you go to sleep, Hold a thought for the 13,000 women in slavery in the UK. Inequality is enormous around all of us. Estimated in the world, there's 40.3 million people in slavery right now. That's massive. It's bigger than it's ever been in the world. And in the UK alone, despite the fact that we have got, uh, Theresa May introduced the most robust um, anti-slavery um, policies that we have in the UK but the government is under resourced and it's not just up to the government every single one of us can be looking out for signs and symptoms of women enslaved in forced marriage in places of inequality and that is about opening your eyes listening careful with the language you use the image you use and and and, and helping to raise awareness and make people around us you can all go to your workplaces and your homes today and say did you know that we can pass trauma through kids <laughs> in epigenetics? You know, start a conversation. And that's, that's the pond and the stone in the pond, and the ripples will go, and we'll tackle it. We'll tackle it. We'll do it, because we're women. It's about mindfulness, too, isn't it? It's about mindfulness. Being aware of what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in an important sort of role. Um, you can go and negotiate the best deal that anyone has ever done, but for the reason you can't care about somebody who yes. can't care for reasons. You know, that, yeah. so that's a huge side that you can bring. But men play a much more difficult role. Yeah. Actually, probably see as lowering them. And I think for a long time we've been encouraged not to not to allow that side to come out because mm. Yes. And natural, um, whether it's mothering these kids or whether it's, um, and this might be a perfect thing for me, but this is what no, I, I, I completely agree. In my career. And I, I think that all of what Sarah Sandberg is talking about is actually having the courage to celebrate people who do it, who do it well, but also to support the vulnerable. And to Absolutely. So it's very interesting that. Um, uh, particularly working in conflict, and as a hostile environment specialist, that is precise. God, you want to spend a lot of time, weeks, in a tent in Afghanistan with a bunch of blokes. That's really smelly. Um, <laughs> and trying to bring some femininity to that is something else. But, you know, that is the absolute, just what you're saying, the epitome of trying to bring femininity to a really male, male environment. But you know what? The more you are, they respond to it. Yeah. They really respond, and you start breaking down. Again, you're challenging the stereotypes. You break them down. You should see their faces when I walk in, and they're like, 
Who are you? They're expecting some big burly bloke from the BBC. Oh, hello! Oh, could you grab that bag for me, please? You know, I'm perfectly capable. But actually, when we, when we start being honest about who we are and celebrating what we bring to the table, and that is our femininity, that is our uniqueness, yeah, we're stunning snowflakes, all of us. But when we bring that in and we start having very honest conversations with men, and particularly in conflict, you know, in conflict very often, in a conflicting conversation or an argument, we'll just, okay, we agree to disagree. Don't do it. Have the conversation. Listen here. You can say, I don't have to agree with you, but I'm going to respect you enough to listen and try and understand with your side of it. I may not still agree, but we are going to have a mutual respect. And I think that's a really important step in pushing the, you know, pushing the boundaries with men particularly. And we do it in our home places, with our partners or whoever, it doesn't matter. But, you know, that I am listening and um, I want to, just as much as you want to be heard and respected, we must do it to others. And that's a big part of creating equality is really listening. I may not really get it, but I am going to listen. I am going to hear and I'm going to ask you more questions, no matter how hard that is, because that enables me to bring my femininity, if that's the example, into it. And you can bring your masculinity and together we're stronger. Yeah. I think it's a really important point. Julie, thank you. You're thank welcome. You so much. I mean, today has been so eye-opening and such a fascinating insight into what is such a very different day job to, I'm sure, what all of us are going back to our desks <laughs> to do today. <laughs> and we've covered so much on this journey. And I think, as I said earlier, those images, those clips will stay with a lot of us and helpfully help us with our mindfulness to be conscious about the impact that our thoughts, our actions, yeah. how we work in as individuals, in teams and communities and societies and ultimately in countries can have an impact. You know, I think you've really challenged all of us to challenge the stereotype, to push for gender equality. You know, we, we're getting there, it's a long journey, but um, I think it's people like us going out to our worlds that yep. make a difference and people like you as well. Thank you for well, all of us. And thank you all for coming today as well. Thank you for listening. Had a good session. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>